Hey, it's Scott Petrick with another episode of the Brown Zone Zone Coverage Podcast. It's the offseason, but not all is quiet in Brownstown. I talked to former defensive lineman Robert Smith about new defensive coordinator Jim Schwartz. Joe Thomas spoke Wednesday night about his Hall of Fame candidacy. And the NFL playoffs continue Sunday. Here to discuss it at all, as always, is Dave Chodowski of Go, the WKYC Morning News. Hey, Judd. Scott, how are you? I'm Good just up. sitting here. I'm just sitting here thinking how I love AFC NFC Championship weekend and how it's been since 1989, right? Since we uh, were a part of it, 80, 86, 87, 89. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. man. I know. Will we ever get back? <laughs> well, you'd like to think so. Um, you'd like to think. You'd like to think so. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a great weekend of football, right? The only problem with it is when it's over, there's only one football game left. Um, I know. Right? But it's, it's great in – I think we're going to have two great games. Oh, I'm excited for it. Yeah, you go from uh, the season ends, and then you still have Saturday, Sunday football for a couple weekends. Now we lose Saturday and just have Sunday, but at least we have two games. Then you have a weekend off, and then you just have the Super Bowl. So you're right. Um, But, yeah, you know, as much as I love the Super Bowl, I do love this Sunday, you know, these two games back-to-back. And, you know, you you just got two great games, right? I mean – the four hottest teams probably in the NFL. So that doesn't always happen. And uh, I'm pretty excited about it. We'll talk about that here towards the end. Um, but first, let's let's just wrap up Schwartz from last week because we taped before his press conference. Uh, how, how did the press conference go? It, it seemed like, you know, the joke around town was, uh, you know, he won the press conference. <laughs> and, you know, that happens a lot. But uh, everyone seemed to be pretty fired up about, uh, you know, everything he had to say and, going down memory lane and all that. Yeah, I, I thought he was good. Um, he gave long answers. Um, he did want to go down memory lane. He talked about that a lot, like probably um, more than I thought he would, you know, like the first few questions, and then he gave long answers and told long stories. Um, but it was good. And then he talked a little bit about, you know, defense and what he's looking for, um, the history, his history of defenses and why they've been so successful. And we knew this before he said it, but you heard him reaffirm it. It's about the defensive line. He said, you know, there are a couple of big takeaways, but I thought one of them was says one of them, the, one of the important ones was he said, you can't win in coverage. And I, I think there's a debate among NFL teams, whether you can win up front or win in the back end. And that means you spend a bunch of resources in coverage and say, hey, if we cover really well, then our guys are going to be able to get home, right? Or if we have great coverage, then we can blitz more because we trust our corners and we trust the safeties. And and I do believe that the Browns at some point under this regime felt that way. Not that they ignored, obviously they paying Miles Garrett a ton of money, but they really felt like they invested a lot of resources in the secondary. And you look at Denzel Ward and – Greg Newsom the second, and then they draft Martin Emerson in the third round, and they pay John Johnson the third a bunch of money. They draft Grant Delpit in the second round. That's a lot of resources there, probably more so than they've spent on the defensive line. And Schwartz says you can't win that way because the rules favor the offense. You know, there's all the defensive pass interference, the legal contacts, right? All the penalties that we see lead to first downs. And he goes, the receivers are just freak athletes, right? I think he called them freak shows. And therefore, it's really hard to win that way. Where up front, I can design a a scheme where I'm getting my pass rushers one-on-one, and they can go win one-on-one, and you can disrupt the quarterback, you can get in his face. And he said that's – he feels like that's the more reliable way to do it. And the offshoot of that is, well, then the Browns better beef up their defensive line, right? Because they have Miles, right now they have Miles Garrett in a bunch of question marks. Um, they don't have another end because Jadavion Clowney's leaving. You know, Taven Bryan's a free agent, and he didn't do much this year. Jordan Elliott struggled in his first year as a starter. So they probably need two D, new D tackles and a new defensive end. And I, I think that – I think we always would have thought that, but I certainly think that that's the top priority – given how Jim Schwartz talked about the importance of the front four. And if you look through his history, whether it's a Tennessee, Buffalo, or Philly, they traditionally had big-time front fours. 
You talked to uh, – how many former players have you talked to about him? Yeah, you know, well, Bear Smith is – and okay. he was one of my all-time favorites. Um, he's a D. Well, he played DN for the Browns when Mangini was here um, in the three-four scheme. But he played D tackle with Schwartz in Tennessee. And I think Schwartz. I think Robert's first year in Tennessee, Schwartz was a linebacker coach. And Robert said that he could tell then that this guy was really smart, related well to players. And then he takes over as coordinator. In 2001, and Robert spent like four of the next five years under him in Tennessee. He left for a year or two and then came back um, before he joined the Browns. Just had a lot of positive stay, stuff to say about Schwartz. And this is not an interview where, you know, I, I think if Robert didn't like him, he would have told me that. He might have said, hey, we're not going to talk about it. I don't want you to write it. But he went, he like, he was effusive in his praise of Schwartz. And I thought not only did he think he was smart, he thinks the the technique – he plays the – you know, it's called the wide nine or the wide five, where you line up the ends outside of the tackle or tight end, right? Whoever the last guy in the line is, you your defensive end is wider than that. And he thinks that's perfect for Miles Garrett. Like, Robert said he'd be shocked if Garrett doesn't get 20-plus sacks because he just thinks he flourishes in, will flourish in the system – and the reason is you can spot the double teams easier because you're so far away. And it makes it like – not only does it make life tougher on a tackle, it makes it easier on the pass rusher because you can see how they're attacking you with chips and double teams, um, which, you know, if you're lined inside, I think it, Robert said it's harder to do it that way. Um, so that should be a benefit to Miles Garrett. And then, you know, we talked about it last week, Chud, that Schwartz has this fiery personality, right? And he – he get, he's not afraid to get in guys' faces. And, you know, Schwartz didn't deny that. He said, hey, you got to go with your fastball. Um, you know, he's tweaked his style a little bit. But Robert said that even with that personality, he's still a player's coach. And he thinks he finds the right balance between demanding and patient. And guys, you know, yes, it may be tough to hear the criticism, but he builds up trust where guys just say, hey, he wants to win, he's being honest, and it doesn't hit the wrong way, where some coaches it does, right? Some coaches it feels like a personal attack. And Robert said that's not how Schwartz is. That's not how he comes across. And Schwartz also said that was one of his main things. Like that's his focus is building that relationship with players. And he says that's way more important than whatever scheme he runs. Wow, twenty sacks for Garrett. That's uh, that that's a highlight of this podcast that people are going to remember. I think. Yeah, he said he'd be scary. He said, "Yeah, Miles Garrett wow. in the system will be scary." Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of scary, and I mean scary good, one of the best of all time, Joe Thomas, twenty third Greater Cleveland Sports Awards last night. We're taping this on Thursday afternoon, and uh, you got a chance to talk to him. Uh, from what I saw. I wasn't there, but from what I saw, and I, I heard an interview with him today, you interviewed him last night, saw some things on social media. Some people at work were talking about uh, his story about Billy Manziel. It sounded like he did a pretty good job. He did, yeah. He was the host. And, you know, that with that job comes like a 10-minute monologue. And he got up there yeah. and played a little air guitar. Um, and then he went into, you know, found stories. And, if, you know, I've talked to – I've covered Joe for – whatever, 16, 15 years now. So I'd heard some of the stories before, right? You listen to his podcast, you hear some stuff. Um, but, you know, if you're just a general Cleveland sports fan, you probably heard, heard all of it. And the Manziel stuff yeah. was great. Um, you know, he told the story about introducing himself to a quarterback in the huddle, uh, you know, in the season finale against Pittsburgh. I think it was John Johnson or Josh Johnson. Um, who had just gotten there that week, and all of a sudden he shows up in the huddle and Joe's like, hey, I'm your left tackle. Um yeah. <laughs> you know, so it was just funny. He told, um, you know, he talked about winning that game, the Christmas Eve game where Jamie Meter, the Froggy Prince of Parma, blocks a field goal. You know, so he just said yeah. a bunch of good stories kind of going down mem memory lane. And he even told a uh, he told a joke kind of taking a shot at Jadavian Clowney, which I thought was pretty funny. Yeah. He said, uh, he said you know, Joe kind of introduced it by, hey, betting's legal now in Ohio. Um, you know, we got the Courage Award coming up. He goes, it's a good bet that David Clowney won't win that, you know, something like <laughs> something along those lines. So he took a little shot at, you know, Clowney who, you know, didn't play first and second down against Baltimore that one game. 
and then you know was suspended the last three game or three days of the season after he publicly criticized the coaching staff. So um, you know Joe's never been afraid to speak his mind, um, and, and yeah. I thought he did a good job. I, I really did. Yeah, well, he's never been afraid to speak his mind, but still, I think he, you know. I, I think he he's dialed it up ever since he retired, though, don't you think? Like, I mean, he, he's been pretty outspoken when doing uh, commentary on, uh, you know, when he's been working uh, NFL games and just different avenues that he does, right? Oh, there's no doubt about it. Yeah, you're 100% right, Chud. You're right. I, I think when we talked to Joe, he would let certain things in, right, if he had an opinion about something. But he did, you know, he was always company line and, um, you know, supported whatever coach there was, whatever quarterback. Um and not that he's taking – he doesn't take shots at the Browns. You know, he's still, you know, a Browns guy. But just in general, his opinions about the league, his opinion about um, – yeah, maybe even some Browns things are certainly um, much sharper and he's not – he's just not afraid because, you know, he's really smart and he knows a lot of stuff and he has opinions. Yeah. All right, so uh, the class of 2023 will be announced February 9th during the NFL yeah. Honors in Arizona the week of the Super Bowl. We're looking at 10 straight, correct me if I'm wrong on any of this, 10 straight Pro Bowls, six all pro selections, and an unprecedented 10,363 consecutive snaps. Now, I think I took that from your article. So if any of this sounded wrong, familiar. Think... No, it sounded familiar. That's, exa <laughs> that's exactly right. Yeah. Okay. So basically, what I'm trying to do is set up. I know you spoke with them last night, and the topic was about him getting in on the first try. Yeah, and, you know, that doesn't happen a lot, right? It's, it, it, you know, getting the Hall of Fame into the Hall of Fame period is a huge accomplishment. And then I think there's a little extra, maybe not even a little, there's an extra level to being a first ballot guy. Probably not as significant as if you're a baseball first ballot guy. Like, it feels like the voters in baseball hold that more sacred than maybe the football voters. But it's still impressive, and it's a difference. It's a separator, at least in my opinion. And I sure as heck feel like Joe is in line to be that guy. Um, you never know how the vote's going to go. Um, the voting has already taken place, but nobody, they haven't told anyone the results. Um, even the voters, they haven't told the voters the results. Uh, but I, I just feel like Joe's going to get in. The, you know, 10 for 10 in the Pro Bowls. Um, the six all pros out of, you know, 10 full seasons is crazy good. Um, you mentioned the snap streak. Did he super... Um, proud of you know I don't, I don't think there's any doubt he's a fall, hall of famer and i feel like he's going to get it on his first try i don't know if it's a slam dunk i asked him that yesterday just you know um how confident are you and he said hey you never know how it's going to go but i'm pretty confident and i took that as far as plus all the other conversations i've heard joe have recently is that he i think he believes he's getting in the hall of fame and i think that's the consensus among kind of the NFL world is that he's going to get in. All right, before we get to uh, anything else on Joe Thomas, I think we no, pretty I mean, much covered. Yeah, yeah and I'm going to – we'll probably talk about it more, and I'll write about it more before those NFL honors. Um, it's just yeah. a huge deal, right? I mean, it's – he's the first guy since 99. Um, I was actually talking to Jimmy Donovan uh, at the awards ceremony, and, you know, we're saying, is this the best – he said, by far, it's the – it will be – the best moment since they came back in 99. It supersedes the playoff win in Pittsburgh, you know, because that was a one-time thing, right? This is a bigger moment. It's It never goes away. And it's, you know, it was 11 years of Joe versus yeah. one day in Pittsburgh. Well, that's interesting. Do you mean that as far as meaning it will mean more for Joe or it no. will mean more for Browns fans? Yeah. It, I mean, the conversation Jimmy and I were having was, organizationally speaking, this yeah. is the best moment will be, would be um, the best moment since the Browns came back in 99. That's interesting. I'd like to put that out, yeah. um, you know, just to hear what fans have to say. It, um, well, you know, obviously there hasn't been a lot of good things to put in that, that column, but beating the Steelers in the playoffs, that's, that's quite the, that's quite an accomplishment uh, when you consider the the pain that we've been dealt by them. So right. yeah, that's in, that's interesting. I, I'm yeah. going to think about that. I'm yeah. going to think about that. Um, I guess one other thing before I go with, with this topic is number one, and I think it's a no brainer. I, I'll be shocked if he doesn't get in first time around. I mean, I guess it's possible, but 
let's say he does. Do you think maybe the Browns will play in that Hall of Fame game? Yeah, I do. <laughs> I do. And I, the only reason I say it like that is because it means training camp would start earlier. One more preseason game to cover is completely selfish. Um, <laughs> saying that what happens with Joe getting in the Hall of Fame would be, um, you know, an elongated season for me. I, I'm assuming that that's what would happen. You know, the Browns haven't played in the Hall of Fame game. I don't think since 99. I think that's the yeah. last time. They, they look, haven't, look, it hasn't look been since you. I started covering the team. Look at you making it all about you, cut track. Well, Joe Batonio said the same thing. <laughs> he said, "He said oh, he goes, we're going to have more practice than a, an extra preseason game." He goes, uh, "He goes, maybe I can get out of some practice." Um, so yeah, yeah I, I think that is the reality. I think the Browns would be playing in Canton, and what a scene that would be. You know, um, I've never been to the Hall of Fame, like the Hall of Fame. I've been to the Hall of Fame. I've never been there during um, enshrinement weekend, and uh, you know. Because usually the Browns are training camp, there's a million other things going on. But obviously I would go for that, and it would be phenomenal, and I I would look forward to that. So that might offset the extra week. Yeah. I don't know, I don't know about that. You know, and if Joe, if I get invited to, you know, one of Joe's parties, maybe that'll soften a blow too. I got to do it one time. I, I will say this, man. The speeches are long. It's a yeah. long night. <laughs> maybe Joe will go first. Yeah, <laughs> well, no doubt. <laughs> we'll have to see if that can happen. Oh, real quick, uh, any other news on the coaching front? Any, uh, you know, anyone else might let go? And uh, any other action um, as far as any coaches leaving to, yeah. you know, leave on their own terms? I'm trying to think. I, I'm try it's all a blur, right? I, we probably talked before Bill Callahan signed the extension. That felt like it was a Thursday or Friday thing last week. So Bill Callahan, the offensive line coach, well-respected. Um, he's staying. So January 20th, yeah, so this was after we talked. Um, so the Jets had asked to interview him for their vacant coordinator job. The Browns instead gave him an extension to remain as their line coach. So he didn't even go interview. He turned down the Jets. But there's stability there, right? The Browns really value him as a line coach. He's a huge part of their run system, run game, all of it. Um, so that's a great that's, – that's good news for the Browns. And then Chad O'Shea, the receivers coach, interviewed with the Jets for the coordinator job, which today went to Nathaniel Hackett, who used to be in Green Bay and then was less than a one and done this year as Broncos head coach. So O'Shea won't get the job there. Um, O'Shea also interviewed with the Ravens for their coordinator job, and they have not made a hire yet. So you have to keep an eye on that, right, to see if, um, you know, if he gets that job, obviously it's a promotion, he would leave. But he's under contract. So if he doesn't get a promotion, the expectation he is he returns to the Browns staff. Um, and then you might get a couple of assistants. Jeff Howard, the defensive backs coach and pass game coordinator, um, he interviewed, I think, for the Chargers linebackers job. I don't know if that's been filled. I know he hasn't gotten that job, so I think it's still open. Um, so you can see some minor movement. Um, we haven't had any, like, official announcement that Mike Prefer staying as coordinator at special teams. But I think if he were leaving, um, we would know that by now. So I, I expect basic status quo um, with maybe a couple of tweaks. I did one more Schwartz thing I'm, that is connected to this. He said it's a De Stefanski decision on the rest of the defensive staff, that he's not coming in and, like, going to hire his own guys. Now, he might hire a guy or two. I, that's just normal, right? You need You want other people familiar with your style, how you call things, how you communicate. But – there's not going to be a complete overhaul of the defensive staff. Um, Stefanski wants to keep at least a few of those guys. Okay, you ready to get to uh, the big weekend, yeah. uh, big Sunday games? We, we, yeah. we done everywhere else? Yep, we're good. All right, so big week for me, not going to lie, because I needed it after, uh, the, you know, straight up, not going against, not with the spread. Week one, I was 3-3 three and three and you were 5-1. and one. Yeah. Last week, I went 4-0. and oh. Uh, picking, I think you went two and two. Yeah, I think well, right? uh, Philly, you, I got right, the, and I you got you had the Bills and, and Cowboys. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I got yeah, because I would have gotten the Cincy spread right, um, but I thought Buffalo would win, and I would have gotten the <clears> Philly spread wrong, but I thought Philly would win. So yeah, 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 yeah two right. two. If we if we just go straight up picks, yeah. I think we're yeah. both we're yeah. both seven and three now. 
Yeah, you're right. You're right. After 10 games. Uh, now, as far as the spreads go, Scott, I was I was a backdoor cover by Jacksonville. That that was ridiculous, that field goal. Anyway, I, that, I was not happy. Oh, about that. The, the Kansas City one? Yeah. Uh, I know, I, yeah, <laughs> I, I'm with you. If they don't kick that field goal, I think I go 4-0 in Vegas because I had – uh, and again, we were we weren't really going hard. I, I I don't think we were. At least I wasn't going hardcore on the lines. But I did say that we both thought Kansas City would cover, yep. and they didn't. Um, but then I had the Eagles. Uh, I, I said the Eagles would cover, and they destroyed them. Yeah, they and then obviously, I think we both took the Bengals and the points. And then uh, the last game was uh, San Francisco. I thought that was a tough one with the Lions, San Francisco. Yeah, game. I thought Dallas was going to pull an upset. And, geez, if Dak Prescott doesn't throw two bad picks, they might, right? Like, I thought the chance was there for Dallas yeah. to go in and pull that off. And, obviously, you know, ifs and buts. But um, I didn't feel terrible about that pick because Dallas hung around. The, I thought the Giants would stay close and they just got obliterated. And you're right. That I mean, this is why gambling is so difficult, especially in the oh. NFL, right? I mean, you're watching that Chiefs game and you think, Mahomes is going out. How are they going to cover? Then he's back and they, they go they go up by 10 and you're thinking, okay, you got it. And then they go into conservative mode because they don't need to score anymore. And then you get a late field goal, right? Like, <clears throat> there's just so many things that can go wrong um, in really any game. That, that That's why it's – that's why it's so hard, and that's why I don't. That's why I don't do it very often. Because no, it's you probably can't, a bad you, idea. Well, and here's the funny thing: people at work and friends, everyone's talking about how much money they're making on FanDuel and all this. And I'm not gonna lie; I jumped in for the free 200 just to see, and I got out right away. Um, but uh, you know, I, I, it, it's fun to dabble in. But here's the problem: you never really get ahead because, for example, for me in the wild card week. I was like, oh, this is why I don't do it. It's so hard. Then last week, I do well, and I'm like, oh, I could right. win at this. Right. But then this weekend, you'll just give it back. It's so hard to stay consistent. It, it really is. is. So, <laughs> I mean, they know more. I feel like I know a lot, and whoever's setting the line knows more, you know. Um, it's unbelievable. It, it really is. It's, you know, it's crazy. Um, but yeah, there's fun to be had. And, you know, now I know people are doing a lot of these parlays and the prop bets, and I've never been into that. Um, but it's true. It's interesting and it sounds fun. Um, I was at this party football party last Sunday and a guy, um, one of my in-laws, he had a parlay with McCaffrey scores two touchdowns, Niners cover yeah. under. Well, he wins two of them and McCaffrey gets a touchdown. And all of a sudden you're thinking, oh my gosh, if they get one more, you know, he would have won two grand on a $5 bet or whatever it was. I don't know what the exact numbers, but it was a big payoff, right? For yeah. the bet, the size of the bet. So now you're, you know, first of all, now you're really interested to see if McCaffrey scores. But the reality is it's probably not a good bet because you need three things to happen, and the odds of three things happening are pretty slim. Um, yeah. Right? But all of a sudden, he's so close. You know, it felt so close. They had the ball inside the red zone in the fourth quarter with the chance to score again. So, you know, it certainly adds some fun if you're doing it the right way. And it's interesting as I'll get out. It's just really hard. Well, I think for me, it's – no, you're right. It does add to the fun. For me, is is like – I just feel like when I win, the good mood that I have when I win isn't doesn't isn't better than how crappy I feel when I lose. So I almost don't want to do it just to stay away from that crappy feeling. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's fair, right? I mean, I get a little bit of that even when I don't like when I just announce who I'm who I think yeah. going to win, right? Like, I feel like totally, is, you know, if, oh my god, I got that pick wrong, you know, and I got nothing right now except whatever credibility I may or may not have. I feel pressure when we make these picks. You're right. I'm watching yeah. the games going, oh, man, on, on the podcast with Petrak, I had this or that. or You know, I was looking at my wife on Sunday, and I said, this is unbelievable. The Cowboys are – well, the Cowboys were four-and-a-half dogs, right? I think yeah, the, I the think Niners right. were – and uh, it was 16-12. to 12, And I'm like, right now in Vegas, the Cowboys <laughs> are up by half a point. And that's in the fourth quarter. Isn't yeah. it amazing how they always seem to have it so close? Yeah, I know. It's crazy. Yeah. Did, did you see uh, Dustin Fox? I did. Um, did you see that one where he the put tight one end? Length? Yeah, it was like a and sixth got... way tight end score first parlay. It was unbelievable. unbelievable. It was like nine hundred grand. Yeah, and he and I think he got three out of four. Yeah, he got. I know he got the first two right, and I think he, I think the early chase touchdown killed it with the Bengals. Yeah. But then he might have gotten. You're right. The, the Dallas one might have wound up being three out of four. Yeah. 
Wow, incredible. So someone was telling me that like he could have jumped out after he got the first two right and made 600 bucks. Well, I wouldn't have jumped out for 600. No. I would have let it ride just like he did. You would think they'd offer more to make it, you know, obviously they probably realize, hey, that's probably not going to happen. But Right. I mean, um, they know I mean, they know the odds and math way better, right? So, yeah. I mean, yeah, but it's, it's all, it's the old, when do you hedge, right? Like, do you hedge yeah. at three? Do you hedge at two? Like, you know, it's right. got to be a tipping point. It's like, you know, you see those when guys, there was a famous story a couple of years ago where some guy had bet the Packers like 10 games in a row and it doubled his money. Well, you know, that's fine. And maybe he had, to, maybe he needed the pack. He had a bet where the Packers would win out and win the Super Bowl and they had to win 11 in a row, whatever it was. Well, you get to a point where now you can hedge for some legitimate money, right? Like, because all you do is to bet that the Packers lose and you get half your money back or whatever it is, right? As opposed to none. Like, if the difference is 900 grand to none, right? Then that's, you can hedge somewhere in the middle, right? If it's 900, or, yeah. you know what I mean? If it's 600 and none, it's like, okay, well, that's, you, know, you can get around that in your head. But there's a number where it just makes sense to whether or not it's the right bet. In my opinion, whether that's the right bet, it just makes sense. So it's not all or nothing, right? Like, yep. All right, let's get on to the games. Um, obviously, so we're both seven and three straight up. I have no idea what we what we are with the line, but not good. Um, Mine's probably, not, good. not good. We're we're both under five hundred, I'm sure. Um, but uh, let's see here. We got checking to see if the lines have changed at all. I got Niners at Eagles, Philly by two, and now I see two and a half. Two and a half, yeah. So it's gone to two and a half. 46 and a half is the over under. That's at three o'clock. Then you got the Bengals and Chiefs. I got now Kansas City at one and a half. Uh, 47 and a half over under. Now that's been wild. That That's changed a bunch since it first came out. Do you have Kansas City getting one and a half? No, giving. Really? Wow. Yeah, that's what I have right here. Kansas right. City, according to this. I know because the Bengals were favored a couple days ago, right? And I know there was a lot of back and forth because uh, I got an email saying this one guy said in 20 years of doing this, he's never seen so much movement on the first couple hours because mm. it was going back and forth. Right, right. One was, yeah. So, I, I mean, I'm just looking at this one app I have. I mean, it could be – Bengals could be favored in other spots, but, sure, you know, sure. um, that, that's what I got here. Anyway, that's the 630 game. I have to tell you, I, you know, this is one of the more difficult – Two combo picks that I think we've had to make in a long, long time. Well, can you remember the spreads ever being this narrow on for no. championship weekend? I mean, that's both of them. That's the thing. Yeah, both of them combined, right? Yeah, you've seen one or the other, but um, you know, I mean, all those years is the Brady and the Patriots, and they were big favorites or whatever. Um, but two spreads under a field goal, um, it's it feels like it's been a long time since that's been the case. Now, if San Francisco was at home, I wonder what it would be. And if Mahomes, you knew he was 100% healthy, I bet it would be Kansas City minus three. That's probably true. I certainly think Kansas City would be favored, um, you know, depending on where the line is. Um, it, it, it might be three. I was shocked when I, when I saw the first line come out Sunday night. I was shocked that it was – as low as it was for Kansas City. And then I, th I think it started Kansas City, went to Cincinnati, and then maybe it's gone back. Um, yeah. But you're right. If it were in San Francisco, San Francisco uh, probably favored by three, you know, three and a half, something like, somewhere like that. Well, and I'm just I'm just thinking, you know, the Bengals are getting four and a half in Buffalo, so I got to believe Kansas City with a healthy Mahomes would be favored well, similar. Yeah. I, well, I think you're right. And then I, I, I do think it matters that, Cincinnati played as well as it did against Buffalo, right? Like, sure. Like, yes. I think that changed the perception of how good Cincinnati is, especially coming off. It didn't play very well against that against the Ravens, right? It was they needed that fumble return for a touchdown <laughs> to kind of beat Baltimore. So, you know, you know, and it's so it fluctuates so much. It felt like they were the Bengals were vulnerable after that bank after that Ravens game, yeah. and now it feels like. They're the best team ever because they went into Buffalo and beat a really good Buffalo team. Well, what did I tell you last week? I mean, I'm telling you, man, Burrow is a machine. He's yeah. just different than other guys. That guy, there's just something about him. You wish he was your quarterback. And, you know, with him on your side, it's just 
He's a killer, man. He really he, is. He's great. I mean, he played better than Allen, right? Like a lot better than Allen. I thought Cincinnati's coaching staff coached better than Buffalo's by a lot. Um, they figured out a way for t- to protect Burrow without three, I think, injured offensive linemen. They figured out a way to get to Josh Allen. He looked uncomfortable. And I didn't think the game plan for Buffalo was great. And I know the weather was some type of factor. Um, but I just didn't like it. Like, it felt con- too conservative at times. Um, they kept handing it off, which they don't really do. Like, I would have liked to see him just, okay, Josh Allen, go win the game. And it never felt like they got there until it was too late. At least that's how I felt it was. Well, and Buffalo just hasn't seemed the same. No. We talked about it last night since he got injured. I, I just – and, you know, you mentioned a couple other reasons why, but – there was just something about Buffalo that didn't seem the same of late. So, it was um, him turning it over killed him just throughout the second half of the season. And then there was yeah. a lot of emotion there, right, with Hamlin. They might have been emotionally drained. They didn't have Von Miller. Like a lot Von goes Miller. into it, right? Like a lot goes into it. But none of that changes how well Cincinnati played. Cincinnati played really well. Yeah. And listen, let me make it clear. I did not think Cincinnati would win by that much. And, uh, you know, to, <laughs> I did not see that happening. I mean, uh, that, that was impressive. That was a blowout. Yeah, no, it was crazy. They, like, yeah. it was dominated. They dominated the game. Yep. All right, let's get on to the uh, picks here. Um, who did we have for our Super Bowl? Bro. I think I had, I had 49ers and Chiefs. You're and alive. You had, you had Chiefs too, right? Yeah, I went Chiefs-Cowboys. I didn't know who Chiefs would come out of, the, out of the NFC. Well, and it could be either of these teams, let's be honest. Yeah. I mean, I, <laughs> this is a tough well, – let's go with that game first. It's at 3 o'clock. Do you want to go first or second? Um, I'll go first on this one. Um, okay. Yeah, I, I think it's a really tough game. We talked about Brock Purdy. Um, I, I thought I thought Dallas exposed some things. No, I mean, he made some big plays and they win the game, right? But they were able to get pressure on him. Um, I think San Francisco only had one touchdown drive. I think Philly's defense is better than Dallas's. Now, they don't have the one guy in Micah Parsons, but their front four is really, really good. Um, they got two big-time cover corners. So it's at home. And now I like Kyle Shanahan, and I think he's probably a better coach than Nick Sirianni. He's more experienced. Um, we got an Ignatius guy calling defensive plays for the Eagles. Um so I, I like a lot of stuff about San Francisco. I'm going to take Philly. I think Hertz is playing better. I think he's a better quarterback than Purdy. Now, he's not that much more experienced. He's a little more experienced. In Philly, Philly's defense, um, the ability for Hertz to run the ball, I think is tough for defenses. Even if you're a really good defense like San Francisco is, you can give up a couple runs to the quarterback. Um so I'm going to take the Eagles, and if I took them, I'd take them to cover just because it's only two and a half. Okay, so you're taking the Eagles. So I, I think, again, this is a really tough one, and I've liked the Eagles all year. I, I think they've they've just been a great team to watch, and clearly at home, there's no question they could, and you could maybe even say should win this game. But I'm going to stick with my original pick of, of the Niners, and you even talked about it that, uh, you know, you didn't want to go chalk, and that's one of the reasons you went Cowboys. So chalk here would be taking the Eagles. Sure. And there's just a gut feeling I have kind of that I'm going to ba- – a lot of what, what I based my picks last week on is what I saw the first week. For example, I didn't believe in the Giants because the Vikings were a fraud, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm not going to totally buy into that domination by Philadelphia. I'm going to look at that as much as – the Giants didn't belong there, in my opinion, as much as the, the Eagles just dominated them. I guess what I'm trying to say is I'm more impressed <clears throat> with the 49ers win over the Cowboys than I am with the Eagles over the Giants when you look at the caliber of the opponent. Huh, Clearly fair. blowing it. What's that? That's fair, for sure. Yeah. Clearly blowing out a team in the playoffs is huge, and what Philadelphia did was exceptional. But I just feel like they're going to pull back and have a little bit of a letdown I think the 49ers with that defense, they're going to go in there and find a way to get it done. And I'm not going to lie, I'm also going to stick with my original prediction. And, I mean, wouldn't I look terrible to take the Eagles now after picking the Niners to go to the Super Bowl? Yeah, you have to. You, you don't have a choice. There. Plus, there's no reason <laughs> There's no reason not to. I mean, yeah. you know, I mean, they played well. Like I said, I, I think Kyle Shanahan might be the best coach in the league. Um, he's an unbelievable game planner. Um, 
so yeah, I mean, there's not, there's nothing wrong with that pick. Um, I, you know, we talked about it week one. I just got a hard time picking a rookie quarterback. There was the last pick in the draft to get him to the Super Bowl, right? They're like, well, he's just, one step away. Tough. I know. I mean, right. <laughs> but then you got to go play well. Like, he's going to have to play yeah. well in Philly, I think, for them to win. And I saw something today. Like, he would be the first rookie quarterback to to go to the Super Bowl. He'd be the lowest ever draft pick, I think, to coach, to quarterback a Super Bowl team. And, like, the youngest quarterback ever to quarterback a Super Bowl team. Say that again. I'm sorry. I think he'd be the first rookie quarterback, mm-hmm. the lowest ever drafted quarterback, and the youngest quarterback to go to the Super Bowl. Wow. Because I think Brady's probably the – right now the – the lowest drafted, right? Six round guy, um, you know. And I, I just saw a tweet, so I can't verify if all that stuff's right. But the point is, this doesn't happen very often, and the reason it doesn't happen very often is because it's hard to do. Yeah. All right. So we disagree on the uh, first game. Let's see if we do on the second game. I'll go first on this one, unless you want to. No, go ahead. Uh, so, you know, obviously my my pick is. Chiefs and Niners in the Super Bowl, so I got to stick with the Chiefs. But I really, I think the Bengals of the four teams might be, you could maybe argue, the hottest. And also Joe Burrow has that killer in him, man. And it's just, but they've won three times in a row against Kansas City. And I just wonder, can they do it a fourth time? Probably, but I'm not going to pick it. I, I think, I think the only reason I'm even questioning I think I told you this at the beginning of the playoffs. The reason I took the Chiefs was Mahomes remembers last year, and I'm going to stick with that. Uh, that guy, I feel like he's going to – he's fueled by it. I think Kelsey's going to have a big game. And uh, believe me, again, easily the Bengals could win this game, but I'm going to stick with my pick of the Chiefs. And uh, they, win a, they win a tight one in Kansas City and get some revenge on the Bengals. Yeah, I'm going with the Chiefs. Um, partial – Part of it is because I picked them right before the playoffs started. And I guess the Mahomes injury would give me an out, and maybe I should take that out. Um, yeah. But I'm, not, but I'm not going to. Um, I, I kind of agree with a lot of stuff you said, Chud. I, I feel like it's going to be hard to beat Mahomes and the Chiefs in Kansas City back-to-back years in the title game, right? Yeah. Like, that's really hard to do. And, may, and maybe it's easier because he's not the same player on the ankle. And maybe that makes all the difference. Um, but he is practicing. So I'm jog a little bit. And I don't know how he, how any of that's possible. Because when he got – when he went down the way he went down, I thought he's I thought he's done. Right? Like you knew – I thought I knew right away it was a high ankle sprain. And guys don't play for weeks after high ankle sprain. So – I'm sure I know he's remarkable. I know it's special because it's a championship weekend. Um, I'm sure he's getting shot up, but well, yeah, I guess would be getting shot up. Um, but all of it, the fact that he's going to play and thinks he's going to be highly functional is remarkable. Now we'll have to see. I know. It. And if he can't move, you know, if if he can't move, then there's some issues there. But they adjusted because Jackson was getting pressure early, and then the Chiefs adjusted. And the, and the Jaguars did not get the same pressure, and Mahomes was able to complete passes even though he couldn't move in the second half. That running back looked really good um, for the Chiefs. So I think they have pieces. Now, I like – like, if you want roster piece by piece, I would probably like the Bengals roster better. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I think they have a better receiving core. Not that the Chiefs don't have receivers, but they don't have the Bengals receivers. Um, you know, Travis Kelsey changes that dynamic, right? He's unbelievable. Um but the Bengals have a lot. They have a lot of pieces, special skill position-wise. A couple pieces on your D-line, right, with Hubbard and Hendrickson and um, Reeder in the middle. Big-time linebacker. A couple big-time safeties. I do think they're kind of vulnerable to corner. Um, so, but hey, there's a lot to like about the Bengals, right? There's a lot to like about their roster. The Bills GM was talking about it, how you can build a roster like this when you don't have – when you have your rookie quarterback and rookie receiver on rookie – or your quarterback and receiver on rookie contracts, right? You can build a lot of depth. You can build a lot of talent across your roster. Having said all that, it's tough to win an arrowhead. It's tough to beat Mahomes. And I do, I do think there's a little bit of their due. Um, 
And, and so, yeah, so I, I'm going to go with the Chiefs. I think it'll be a great game. I think Burrow's going to play great. Um, but I'm taking the Chiefs. It's so hard to pick against Burrow, man. And I have to be honest, and this is tough for us as Browns fans and, you know, guys that cover the Browns. Man, it's hard not to root for Burrow. Like, when I watch the guy play, like, you know how, like, as a kid, man, I hated always so much. Right, and there's right. so many different court. We, we hated Roethlisberger watching him. It's tough to hate this guy because, you, you know, being the Ohio guy and just I love his press conferences. I love his quotes. Like, he's a guy, man, I just wish he was my quarterback is what I'm saying, you know? <laughs> yeah, I, I completely get that. It's an interesting dynamic because, yeah, there's a ton to like about him. You laid out all the reasons. I think is a Browns fan, you know, and, and I don't I don't consider myself a Browns fan now because I'm so, you know, been covering the team for so long. Right. But, like, I was at that party, right? And it was divided between people who like to root for Joe Burrow versus people that say, I can't root for the Bengals. Right, like, right, I mean, totally. That's, like that's a that's a completely whatever normal argument to have, and I I think my default would be I can't root for the Bengals. Like I I think that's what yeah. the default would be, especially like Mahomes is a likable guy, right? Like I don't think there's a team coming out of the NFC that's unlikable. Like you know, last year you had the whole Odell Rams thing, right? Like oh, yeah. there's a there's a different dynamic to that where for me this you know. It, it just feels – how do you root for a rival? Whatever, right? Like, would you root for Michigan? I know. You know what I mean? No, that kind of yeah. thing, right? Like, and I know – and you can rank the be- the Browns' rivals however you want, but you play them twice a year in state. Like, I just think that would be hard to do. You you might not believe this. This might shock a lot of people when I say this. I'm more impressed after really thinking about it. Now, it was in Buffalo, and the Bills are a great team. But with the snow, I felt like that changed a little bit and all the different. I might be more imp- impressed with the Chiefs win over the Jags because I think the Jags were hotter than the Bills. That's I know that sounds crazy. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. And I'm going to closer I'm game. Gonna, yeah. And yeah. I'm going to take that as part of the reasoning why I'm also going to pick the yeah. Chiefs. I just think, uh, I don't know, the, the Bengals, maybe we'll see the Bengals struggle a little bit like they did against the Ravens more so than last week, but we'll yeah. see. Um, yeah. Could go. Listen, we both agree we could have a lot of different combinations of the Super Bowl. But bottom line is, you go Chiefs, Eagles. I go Chiefs, 49ers. There you have it. Yep. Yeah, I'm looking forward to. It. I just hope the games live up to the uh, live up to the spreads, right? Live up to the yep. fact that we think they're going to be close. Because if if the games live up to, then um, it'll be a fun Sunday for sure. Yeah. Well, here we are. I thought this would be about 15 or 20 minutes, and what do we do? We just ramble. We ramble on because we, we have joke. fun, right? We do. I know. I was thinking that too. I'm like, I'm like, I'm loving this, but we're going longer than we thought. Well, yeah. I appreciate it, Chad. Um, we'll check in. I don't know if we'll check in next week, but we'll definitely check in before the Super Bowl. Um, yeah. Depending on what's going on. So um, thank you for the time. Thanks everybody for listening. This has been another episode of the Zone Coverage Podcast, and you can read all my work at brownzone.com.